Okay. Uh, thanks for uh, logging on and uh, downloading this YouTube video on battery system models. Um, this is uh, a lecture to replace uh, the lecture on Tuesday, which is the 25th of February, 2014. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of this battery system modeling stuff, putting together all these different topics that we've been working on. Uh, in the class and trying to come up with a complete uh, model for different chemistries of batteries. And we're going to start out with the lead acid battery. Um, last time in class we, we did a little bit on the lead acid battery. We, um, for example, showed up here the, the electrode reactions and the positive electrode and the negative electrode. <coughs> we showed that in both cases uh, you're taking lead dioxide or you're taking lead, uh, adding sulfuric acid, and uh, either producing electrons or consuming electrons depending on which uh, electrode you're at. But in both electrodes, acid is being consumed. So if you're going to look at the concentration of, of, um, of acid in the, in the actual uh, electrode, for example, uh, the left electrode here being the positive, the right being negative, separator in the middle, then um, you're, you're actually going to see the concentration going down in both of these electrodes. Now, the uh, it's what's called a binary electrolyte because there's two ions in the electrolyte. You can see that we have uh, HSO4- minus and H+. Plus. So the total rate of diffusion um, is, is kind of a mix of both of these. And uh, therefore, it's called a binary electrolyte. And they're typically a little more complicated than the uh, unary uh, electrolytes that lithium ion cells have, for example. So here's, again, the, the model that we have. We have a positive current collector, a negative current collector, as I mentioned before. It's a 1D model, so we're only looking at the, the transport of ions from anode to cathode along this x-axis. And we're assuming that the y and z axes, everything kind of working in parallel, and so you can just basically not worry about any diffusion processes acting in those. Just assume that across the thicknesses, everything is uniform. So on the positive electrode, we have porous lead dioxide. On the negative electrode, we have porous lead. In the middle is this uh, separator, which could be porous polymer rubber. In some cases, if it's a flooded lead acid battery, there'll actually be no separator. The plates will just physically be uh, separated and uh, in, in a big pool of lead uh, of sulfuric acid there. Um, so if you look at the variables we're interested in this problem, one is exchange current density. And so anywhere there's an electrode, and there's an exchange between ion transport and electrons, uh, there's going to be this exchange current density. Uh, one side, that current density on the solid phase is going to be electrons. On the other side, the, the, uh, um, the exchange current is going to be ions. And uh, so that happens everywhere. There's solid phase and electrolyte together. Again, this is a porous material. The electrolyte goes all the way across the electrode in both the positive and negative, and in fact, across the whole domain through all three of these domains. So anywhere you have solid phase, you have exchange current density. You also have solid phase potential. So you see that in both the lead and the lead dioxide electrodes. And uh, the green, it's not as clear here, but it it's, has two parts is the electrolyte. That goes all the way from one end to the other. It has potential, Phi E, and has concentration, C. Okay, so let's look at the uh, equations that we have for uh, lead acid batteries. The only diffusion that occurs in a lead acid battery is the diffusion um, in the electrolyte. So there's no solid phase diffusion in, in these problems. Um, and so the electrolyte diffusion is a planar diffusion problem. You basically have, um, as shown here, you have some concentration C of X and T, and you can differentiate with respect to T or differentiate with respect to X. So we've seen this kind of diffusion equation before. 
here. Epsilon is a porosity. D effective is the effective diffusivity of the ions. In this case, the binary, two different types of ions uh, are, are diffusing in this problem. And then you have the current density. So I haven't put JP or JM in here because this actually works over the whole domain from X going from zero to L. And uh, so this we're calling equation one, standard planar uh, diffusion problem. Now, um, there's actually some uh, parameters in here into this model that actually have different values in all three domains. So obviously Faraday's constant is uniform, is fixed, uh, but the porosity, the diffusivity, and this exchange specific interfacial area changes by a factor of 10 from charge to discharge. So this combined quantity um, you know, has quite a large variation on charge and discharge. And this actually is a nonlinear effect because, well, or bilinear because it, it depends on the sign of the J, but that's embedded deep in the equation, so it becomes nonlinear. You know, for the modeling stuff that you, you do when you do a simulation, you could change this diffusivity based on whether it's positive or negative charge. It's kind of a unique feature of lead acid batteries. Okay, uh, then every time we have a, a PDE like this, we have to have some boundary conditions. So if you look, uh, this is ion, concentration of ion. So there's no flux of ions at either current collector. So we have zero flux at x equals zero and L. And then you have flux and concentration con continuity at these domains. Right, there's the same amount of ions enter this side as leave, leave this side as enter this side. It's true in both of these boundaries. So that's, uh, you know, a concentration uh, continuity and flux constant, a flux continuity. So concentration doesn't change, and the flux has to be the same at L1 and L2. Okay, um, let's continue with the electrolyte then and, and actually look at uh, the potential in the electrolyte. So the, the electrolyte voltage, if you will, changes as you move from one electrode to the other. And uh, there's an effective uh, conductivity and there's a diffusional conductivity, which we're calling KD effective. And that actually says that if there is a concentration gradient, that does affect the potential. And this is an interesting coupling term that makes these problems a little more challenging. Because now, you saw previously in the C uh, uh, diffusion equation for concentration, there was no phi E, no other variables other than J appearing. Now you actually have coupling between phi E, C, and J in this one equation. So um, this is basically saying, you know, there's a certain amount of current or ions that are, are fluxing into the uh, electrolyte. Uh, that's this term. But there's also some of it's being stored in a double layer, and this is what's called the double layer current. So it turns out another unique feature of lead acid batteries is that they have um, a double layer that stores a, a lot of uh, current, and that can act like basically a capacitor uh, as you charge and discharge. And in fact, there are supercapacitors that are lead acid capacitors that uh, use this idea. So if you look at uh, charge conservation in the electrolyte, we have zero field at x equals zero and L. Um, and the flux, and, and, and by field I mean partial phi E by partial x. So there's no field at those two ends. Uh, flux and potential continuity at x equal L1 and L2. So obviously phi E has to be constant across these boundaries. There's no jump. And you also have to have that um, the flux, if you or the field has to be the same. Okay, so that's equation two in our lead acid battery model. Um, okay, so we did introduce this new new uh, variable, which is IDL, the double layer current. So we actually have to have a way of um, modeling that. And basically, what we do is we look at the SEI interface. On one side, you have the solid. The other side, you have the electrolyte. So this is the interface between the two. Now, normally, we would just have a resistance and uh, a U, which is your open circuit potential voltage there. 
And this res resistance is essentially linearization of the Butler-Volmer equation, which we're going to talk about down here. Well, in the case of lead acid and actually lithium ion, if you really want to model the higher frequency behavior, you have to uh, include this capacitor. And so what that means is this IDL is which basically the current running through this leg of this equivalent circuit has some area, some uh, capacitance associated with it, and depends on the difference between phi s and phi e. So it's a standard equation for a capacitor, I equals c d v dt. All right, so that's equation three. Uh, so we haven't introduced any new variables. I guess so far we all we have a c and phi e uh, and j. Uh, so now we, with IDL, we introduce a new variable, which is phi e. Uh, sorry, phi s, which we haven't talked about yet. That's coming down a little later. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, th there's a relation between uh, current and over potential in batteries. The over potential for a lead acid battery, depending on whether you're in the uh, negative or positive electrode, is phi s p minus phi e minus u p v o two. Uh, in the positive electrode, it's phi s m minus phi e in the negative electrode. Uh, and the negative electrode, there is some UPB, but it's pretty low, so we just basically neglect it here. And again, this is linearization of that nonlinear relationship between J and eta, which is fairly accurate as long as your uh, C rate is not too high. So if you look at applying this equation to the positive and negative, you get two equations for the current density in the negative electrode. Uh, which depends on this. Um, and again, this is kind of interesting here because, you know, again, there is some thickness to the electrode. But it turns out that conductivity is so high that you don't need to actually solve for that distribution in current. And we'll see down here how you solve for phi SM and phi SP. You'll notice these are only a function of T, not of X. So that's an assumption. We assume that phi SM is not a function of X. And as I said before, we, we neglect UPV. So if you go to the positive electrode, the same arrangement there. Um, and now it's phi SP, again, not a function of X, just a constant, and phi E uh, and UPVO2. So the conductivity of the electrodes lead obviously is very high. And so there's really not much of a distribution in voltage across the, um, across the solid phase lead and lead dioxide. So uh, this assumption right here about about these two things, one is that UPVO2, we're going to linearize it, so there's some average or kind of set point uh, voltage, and then this change that depends on concentration. And here we're just assuming it's zero, and that's pretty good for a wide range of SOC operating conditions, up to 100% down to about 17. Okay, so that's equations four. Actually, there's two equations, four, or maybe four plus and four minus. And um, so let's next talk about charge conservation. So we're going to start to use a little bit of the, the tricks and tools that we used before uh, to do charge conservation. Remember what we said is that a lot of times if you have, uh, like in this case, solid phase potential, it's a differential equation. Uh, the only thing that's different is we have this IDL appearing. We can just integrate that thing uh, and use a boundary condition, which says that there's uh, some field at the boundaries. Um, and uh, when we do that in the positive electrode, we get the following uh, equation. And in the negative electrode, we get the following equation. So these are the two additional equations that you need, equation 5 plus and minus, if you will, that relate the um, you know, same variables we've been talking about before. Now, what's interesting about this integral, some of these things do not depend on x. So you could actually take them out, like this term right here is independent of x. It does change positive, negative, and separator. There's nothing in separator. but you know, this could actually move outside, whereas phi e is a function of x and t. Uh, and u, pbo2, we said was a function of c, which also depends on x and t. Um, 
So you can't really pull those out of the integral yet. But what we have is one equation for basically Vsp that we're looking for, because Vsp and Vsm are just you know, functions of t, not x and t. All right, so we want to check the solvability, a typical thing to do. We've got five equations, all those green highlighted equations. And we have five unknowns, which are Vs, Ve, Cj, and Idl. So I think we're OK. Um, now the input to the equations is current. You see it appearing here. The output, V, can actually be written in terms of the solid phase potential in the negative electrode, the positive electrode, and this average U bar, PVO2. So this is just something we add in later on because we linearized all the equations at some operating point. Uh, these things change dynamically based on these, these five equations up above. Okay, so again, the, we have all the equations. Now the next step is to figure out how to discretize them. And so if we move down here, um, the method that works really well uh, for uh, lead acid batteries because all the diffusion is in the electrolyte you have to actually include you know the whole electrolyte dynamics you have three domains for the electrolyte negative positive and separator and uh, so the Ritz method actually turns out to be fairly uh, efficient for this um, system and what the Ritz, Ritz method basically says it's it's kind of like doing the Fourier series um, you know, you're basically saying, let's take concentration, right? We have C, which is a function of X and T, and Phi E, which is also a function of X and T. Uh, all the uh, J is a function of X and T, but it's just a, an algebraic relationship with other variables. And Phi S, P, Phi S, M, they're not, uh, they're, they're actually um, uh, independent of X. So we can actually just express these two fields, you know, phi of x and t and c of x and t in terms of some known functions times some unknown uh, variables. So these things have to be given and so we just take cosine functions because they satisfy the BC's at, at x equals 0 and L. Remember we had to have sort of zero slope in C, zero slope in phi e at x equals 0 and L. And they also automatically satisfy continuity at those intermediate points. The slope is, is the, uh, the concentration and potential would be uniform at those interfaces. Now, they don't actually satisfy the uh, condition that you have, a, you know, basically this flux boundary conditions, the flux has to be constant. But you can, you know, basically the Ritz method allows you to, to not satisfy those conditions. Okay. So we can actually write the final equations for this model. Once we plug in these expressions into all the equations, we do these integrals that we have to do for the Ritz method. Uh, you have two inputs. One is the current. The other is this kind of bias set point value of potential. And then you have basically a whole lot of states in your state vector. So it naturally gives you the state variable form where you have you know, C0 through CN minus 1. So you have a zeroth uh, term, which is a constant in concentration. Uh, but it really doesn't matter so much with phi e, because you always take a difference, so a constant. Uh, so you start from phi 1, which would be just the single cosine, uh, up to phi n minus 1, to kind of give you the nth order kind of model. Then you have two more variables, which are phi sp and phi sm. And you can then calculate j, idl, those other things from that. So we can put it into state variable form. And uh, that state variable form um, we can then use to do a simulation. And uh, so I just wanted to show you some results here from the simulation that we get um, using this model. So uh, this is actually showing two different cases both of which starting from a 70% state of charge. So that basically is what tells you that kind of bias voltage is going to be around a little over 2 volts. So you can see in both these simulations you start out 70% state of charge, a little over 2.12 volts. Now when you discharge, of course, the, the voltage drops. And that's because the current or the concentration is going down. And that's what drives the uh, U uh, uh, 
um, the potential there. Uh, in addition, there's an ohmic drop. So when you first apply it, there's some resistance that, that happens. And then you get this kind of slow decay, fast initially, and then kind of a, a slow steady state decay. Now, what you'll notice is the, the transient time is different, right? Because this time is 900 seconds is the same for the, the charge and discharge. And remember that we change the parameters in this model depending on the sign of the current. So in this case, when you're charging, you see a jump and then a fast transient and then kind of that integrating up of the voltage. Um, and in this case, the transient is very fast. It has a short transient. You know, this transient is over. This little current corner here is over in maybe 20 seconds, whereas here it took hundreds of seconds. So that's that 10 times difference that you see in lead acid systems. Now it's very interesting to look at how the other internal variables evolve with time. And um, so, you know, one of the variables we had was acid concentration. And we said that acid concentration had to satisfy a number of conditions. And again, this is going over the whole length of the domain from zero to one. It had to have zero slope at the two ends. And so you can see right away that these are all different concentrations at different times. So the initial concentration is uniform. Okay, at, here's t equals zero, it's uniform. And uh, in this case, we're charging, and as we charge, the concentration is actually increasing on both the negative and positive electrodes. So by the time you get to 900 seconds, there's an actual distribution in concentra concentration. So this is the separator in the middle, so there's really no con consumption of uh, acid here in the middle. But uh, what you see is, or production of acid, is what you're seeing is that as you're charging this, you're converting lead sulfate back to lead and lead dioxide, and you're increasing the acid concentration. So you can, first of all, you see that the, the, the concentration increases a lot more quickly uh, on this side than this side, and that has to do with the fact that there's different rates of uh, conversion of, of, you know, create and creation of acid in the two electrodes. So what you see is that wherever there's a slope, you tend to have a diffusion of ions in the direction of lower concentration. So what you see is this starts up, you know, quickly jumping up. This is not so quick, but you're seeing that now in the middle here, it's also seeing an increase, and that's just from diffusion from both sides. And eventually, if we let this thing sit for a long enough time uh, without doing any charging, it would again level out at an average, higher average level of, of concentration. So we see uh, a lot of our boundary conditions are being satisfied. You know, the slope at the two ends, automatic in that Ritz method. You aren't going to see a kink here, which, which actually should happen with the slope, um, but it won't so much with the, with the Ritz method. So um, this is, again, the distribution of concentration uh, at sort of that final value of t equal 900 seconds. And you can look at some other variables uh, and how they vary across the spatial domain here. Remember we said that the solid phase potential was going to be constant in the anode and the cathode. So you see this nice straight lines. That's just because that was our assumption. But the potential in the electrolyte actually, it's not the same as a solid because there's this um, solid electrolyte interface between the two. Um, you know, here, again, there's some resistance. We're talking about ions moving across, so there's going to be a kind of general flow of ions in the direction of uh, whichever uh, charge uh, potential is, is better for that gradient. So the neat thing about this model is, of course, it does predict voltage and current, but it also predicts these internal variables of interest. So if you put it all together and just look at what happens when uh, you charge and discharge an actual lead acid battery. This is some experimental data. The black curves is experimental. The blue dashed line is our switched linear model. So you can see here again it was at rest and we do a uh, positive charge, discharge, charge, discharge, and rest. 
uh, over 2,000 seconds. So this is what the pulse profile looks like. So the SOC doesn't vary much, but you know we're getting some pretty large current. You can see the model and the experiment match pretty well. One of the things you can see is that if you don't include the different parameters for charge and discharge, you can see here's the blue dash is the charge model. It's not working very well during discharge. The red curve is a discharge model. It's not working very well during uh, charge, uh, but it's matching well during, during discharge. And same with the charge model. It's working pretty well during charge. Now, if you just take the average model, or you average everything, and you don't include any distributions at all, it's, it doesn't do a really good job of capturing this pulse behavior. So there you have it, um, a complete lead-acid model that predicts voltage given the current and also um, predicts these internal variables. So next time we're going to go on to talk about a lithium-ion battery uh, model, um, and I'll see you in class for that.